So again, thanks everybody for coming out to today's webinar. Again, it's maintaining QA productivity in a work from home world. Uh, appreciate you taking the time out of your workday, especially in this unusual environment, uh, to spend time with us. Uh, we're here to talk about how we can maintain productivity as we move to a remote testing environment or as we have moved to a remote testing environment over the last few weeks and just some best practices that we can convey uh, in this new world. Um, again, uh, if you have a question during the course of the conversation, please enter that into the Q&A section or the chat room. Uh, so an agenda for today, uh, how today's new normal has created two work from home paradigms. There's, um, you know, we'll talk about what that means, but we have to kind of keep in mind that there's what traditionally has worked for remote testing teams. And while some of those things may continue to work, there's certainly gonna be some differences in just how our work from home environment is today. So as we go through the presentation, we'll take a look at two different paradigms and really look through both lenses. Uh, we'll walk through creating an ideal or at least a close to ideal schedule for your teams, as well as our favorite tools and techniques for a work from home team. We'll also talk about cultures that work great for this type of work and how to create a similar culture with your team, one that will really fit your environment and your organization. And then finally, we'll discuss some of the lessons that we've learned just in our history of leading remote teams, as well as the past few weeks and, and how those uh, have differed. Um, of course, we'll have an open discussion and, and a Q&A at the end as well. I uh, wanted to have everyone introduce themselves. So we have a, a great team of panelists today and uh, I will uh, turn it over first to Kim. Hi, I'm Kim Bunda and I'm one of the um, original founders of TAPQA and a partner. Hi, I'm Rick Pope and I've been in IT for about 23 years and I'm currently on an engagement at Red Wing Shoe Company. Hi, I'm Chris Fisher. I work at the National Association of Insurance Commissioners in Kansas City, and I manage a BA, QA, and UX team. Thank you all for spending your lunch hour with us. I'm Josh Brenneman, Director of Delivery and Talent at TAP QA. I've been in the field for about 13 years, 10 of which as a, as a consultant, so I've been involved with a lot of companies during that time. Great, thanks everybody. Um, and then really quick, won't spend a lot of time here, just wanted a quick word about TAP QA. Uh, we're one of the country's leading QA software, QA and software testing services firms. Uh, we've led a lot of testing projects with remote teams, as a lot of our clients utilize our onshore testing model. So we're leading, uh, we're leading engagements where we have consultants who are out in the field, some at our office in Minneapolis. Um, we've done a lot of work and put a lot of strategy and process together around remote testing. Um, we're experts in QA staff augmentation. We're just totally focused on QA. And one fun fact, we actually turn 10 years old tomorrow. So it's our 10th birthday tomorrow. And that is not an April Fool's joke. Our birthday was April 1st, 2010. Our 10th birthday is tomorrow. So we're excited about that as well. Uh, you can go to our newly redesigned website at tapqa.com to find out more. So really quick, some questions uh, to get started here. Uh, First question, is your organization officially in a work from home capacity for the time being? And how many of you are leading a remote testing team for the first time? Uh, I will start the poll here. So hopefully you can see that now. Um, so feel free to uh, jump in on both of those questions. I'll give you a few seconds to to answer. Yeah, we'll give you uh, five more seconds. Thanks again for uh, engaging on these. It's just great for us to, to get to know a little bit more about you as the audience and how we can kind of gear our, uh, our presentation. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll share the results here as well. Um, Kind of predictable being that this is the topic of the presentation, but uh, almost everybody is in a work from home capacity for the time being. There's one of you that said probably won't be. Um, but question number two is a little more interesting in that, uh, you know, for some of you, this is the very first time that a majority of your team or your entire team <clears throat> is working remote. Um, a lot more of you have had a small part of your team uh, working remote, and then you've, there's some of you that have led remote testing teams for a while. So it's good to have, uh, you know, that, uh, that spread of, of attendees so that we kind of know that we, uh, you know, our best practices are ones that will be, um, you know, 
heard by folks that have, that have done this for a while and those doing it for the very first time. Uh, so thank you, for, thank you for participating in that. Um, what are the biggest challenges that you are currently facing? So feel free to type that into the chat room. Uh, we'll give you a few minutes to do that or a couple minutes to do that. And uh, while you're doing that, I'll, I'll put the next question up as well. And that is just, what are you hoping to get out of today's session? So some of the comments that we're seeing, keeping the team feeling engaged as a whole and not isolated. Um, that's probably, uh, as we have experience with TAP QA and experience with our clients, that's, that's, if not the number one concern, it's definitely on the list of the top two or three. Um, you know, isolation and just kind of keeping everyone engaged and keeping everyone from feeling, um, you know, something that they've just never really experienced for a lot of the folks that, uh, you know, are doing this for the first time. Um, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a critically important thing. Um, keeping a team engaged, plus making sure work is getting done. That's probably the most important thing is just uh, the accountability. And that's, uh, that's a certain challenge here as well. Uh, building trust among team members, struggling with lack of social interaction, um, technologies. Some agencies are not prepared to handle the large volume of remote staff. Uh, so we'll talk through some of the tools that we use that will hopefully help with, um, you know, a larger team. Uh, one of our attendees said, I have some staff that need more direction and supervision, and that's difficult to do when priorities change. Now, that's a very good point, and we'll, uh, we'll address that as well. And then just keeping work hours from expanding. Um, it's interesting that I, I feel like some people actually work more uh, or work, you know, longer hours, uh, work into the night a little bit more. Um, you know, in this work from home environment. And there's, there's some important reasons for that and some reasons that we'll touch on as we talk about kind of the new paradigm of, uh, of what's happening right now. And then um, as far as what to get out of today's session, uh, one of our attendees has said, more ideas of what to do as we see an increased time period of work from home. Um, and I, I assume by that you mean the increased time period going into now April, uh, potentially beyond April into May, just depending on what the CDC recommendations are. Um, and also probably just what, uh, you know, with, with work hours during the day and some of the, uh, you know, as I just mentioned, sometimes people are stretching work hours into night and everything. So um, these are all great points, really appreciate it. And we'll touch on all of these items as we go through our presentation. Uh, so again, our, our biggest goal here today, we want to help you build a great work from home testing situation. Um, this is something that is a, uh, it's a unique challenge. It's something that not a lot of us were prepared for. Probably none of us were prepared for, at least in the way it's unfolded over the last seven weeks. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel like my new normal looks like this sometimes. Does anyone remember this? A uh, gentleman from the BBC he was in the past, he was doing a broadcast and <laughs> kids are in the background all of a sudden interrupting. Uh, I think the nanny had to come in and like grab the kid who had like wandered in there and everything. Um, it's, it's just kind of a, it, it's an interesting new normal. I've had my daughters interrupt a few Zoom calls. I've had our dog uh, come into the room. Um, the, the new normal is just, you know, a lot more distractions than we're probably ever used to. Uh, just given that we have so many people who are working from home or taking school from home or just being home now that a lot of us are, uh, you know, under a shelter in place order and everything. So the new normal, what it means for remote testing teams, there are, are now two paradigms for work from home environments. Uh, it's different than anything we've experienced before. Um, there's the traditional <laughs> way of success with remote testing, and now there's the new paradigm. So as we go through our presentation today, we are gonna look through both lenses and best practices that, you know, might work for, might work for the traditional model may not necessarily work now. Uh, as we mentioned, a lot of the folks that you're managing and a lot of the folks that are on your team, they aren't just your team members and employees at this point. They're also, they're, they could be a third grade teacher. They could be uh, a cook. <laughs> they could be a driver. Uh, there's just a lot of responsibilities that real life has kind of thrust on us now that we're just not accustomed for. Um, so today's environment and the traditional environment, there are going to be some, some differences. So what we'll do today is really take a look through both lenses during our talk. Um, we have a few questions that I'll be addressing to the panelists and uh, the answers to those questions will hopefully be able to generate some ideas in, in your mind as far as how this can also work for your team as well. So getting started, um, and Kim, I'm going to start with you on this one. Josh and Kim, 
Um, as far as schedules go, um, a lot of success can really be boiled down to just the schedule that we have our team members working on. So what guidance would you give a remote testing team uh, as far as creating an ideal schedule? So I think this was a very interesting question. So we had this figured out, right? Um, yeah, I'd say in the traditional model, we, we got pretty good. So we have some tips to talk about. And, you know, those those ideas for you know way back in the day of three weeks ago now seem like they've changed a little bit so we want to contrast that a bit but kirk can you put up the slide on a couple of thoughts we have put together around the traditional model of remote working cool so what we would have said uh you know a couple of weeks ago was to recommend a core hour schedule because you know everyone has their preferences for when they work we have the early morning people who want to start at six and be done as soon as possible right and we have the people who like to sleep in and work later but to find that core common time of hours for the team works for, for great shared availability, collaboration, lack of handoff when you're, or a lag time doing handoff between projects, you want to get a hold of someone, or tickets come in from development to test. It all can happen during a, a good core schedule and they're all available. It's a bit easier to know who's working when they should be working. Generally, these people are, should be available in IM or for quick phone calls during that core hour schedule. And it, it was a nice way to ensure some sense of, you know, a bit more like going to the office with their core common work days, but still giving some more flexibility. Yeah. And, you know, some, some other thoughts just around all of that. Um, you know, it's really, it's important to establish um, a meeting cadence of what are your standard meetings that you're going to use, what are going to be some random meetings that you might be popping up on the schedule and stuff, but the, the normal cadence of your, your meetings that you're going to have on a week by week basis or daily basis is really important to have that established on everybody's calendars and then set expectation for attendance in those meetings um, is a, a, you know, a, a thought that I have um, that's worked, that's been important is to understand, you know, making sure that each team member understands what their attendance um, expectation is. Um, so if you have like your daily standups, which is a great way to kick off the day for so that everybody your team they're all in different locations they're not talking one on one with each other as much so to have that daily stand up and really get the team all on the um, same page to start the day off with is really great. Um, and then for your meetings it's kind of really important because everybody again is remote is to you know establish your new meeting rules um, as you're remote so does everybody have their video on. Um, if you have video on, people are more are more likely to be paying attention, not multitasking. They're going to be more engaged. They're going to be more accountable during the meeting. The meetings go faster. Um, to be honest with you, they do. So you know that's that's a good rule to have in place. Um, if it's not you know a hundred people on the screen or you don't have a presentation like this now that you need to put up on the screen. Um, you know, but just establish some of your meeting rules that you want. Make sure that you kind of recap the meeting if it's a long meeting and just under, so that everybody again understands what the goals are, um, what the time frames might be. Um, so just kind of uh, recap that meeting a little bit. And then um, encourage chatter and offline meetings. Um, for specific topics where you may only need a couple people or a few people instead of trying to do it in the larger group meetings um, because you start to lose attention span. So those are some thoughts that I have about your, your traditional model, but really, you know, make sure you have an action plan from each meeting so that people are very clear. I'd like to throw in too that just some things that we considered when we set up our meetings or as we're going into this work from home atmosphere, um, look at your environment. You know, you want to make sure that you, you're spread out right, that you're in the proper place, that, that the setting works for you offsite, because now this is, this is basically somewhere where you're going to spend a lot of time. Um, also look at your daily volume of business. You know, what are your, when are your heavy times at work? So you want to make sure that people are, are accessing the systems at that point. You want to look at builds. 
uh, different meeting cadences, as Kim mentioned. Um, when do people naturally take breaks? You want to look at those sorts of things. Um, in setting up that schedule, you want to look at what time of day works best for the team. Is it going to be like, like, uh, like Josh said, is it going to be an early morning meeting, a midday or an end of day, or maybe all three during these times where you're starting up a team of people that are working from home? Oh, the other thing that you want to look at too, or that we've looked at is scheduling our, uh, our morning standups. We do morning standups at Red Wing, but we schedule them so that if you need to attend someone else's standup, all the standups are at different times. So there might be four meetings right away in the morning, but there'll be like 10 to 10, 15, 10 30 to 10 45, 11 to 11 15. So you have a chance to go to another meeting if you have cross, uh, cross work that's going on. And I don't have a lot to add to this particular slide because at the NAIC, we allow work from home. We've got some people who work from home maybe one day a week on a regular basis, or if people have a sick kid or we have bad weather or something like that. Um, in this model, though, everybody is just expected to kind of follow what they do in the office. And so we haven't seen this huge shift until we're going to talk about, I believe, uh, the next slide and some ways we've had to make adjustments to that. Yeah, good segue, Chris. So this is, you know, as we talked about the traditional model versus the new normal, um, some of the things that we've already touched on is just some differences and really the biggest difference is probably just the flexibility that we need to allow our, uh, our team members, our employees to have uh, to complement their personal responsibilities. Whereas core hours, are, they're a lot easier to enforce under the original model or the traditional model. Um, it, it's, it's just harder to enforce right now and, and, and really you know enforce is probably not even the right word it just sounds a little uh harsh i guess but um but josh you know touch on on the, you know some of the additional things with the new normal if you would yeah well you know a lot of us have now shifted to homeschool models where you know some kids can't get on google hangouts or do coursework or flip through slides you know I'll, independently so we have to just build in flexibility for our team members to be able to go take care of things they need to take care of. And so we're, we're shifting, you know, from a expectation, maybe enforces not a bad word, Kirk, but expectation of just during these hours you are available and committed to work to being more open about things. We still want accountability and there's, there's ways that we can get there. Um, but it's also, we expect if, if we're going to be loosening up our expectations, we also want our team members to be very transparent about their availability. And so one way to do that is to put into Slack if you're all in a group chat or just make a schedule for when they can be online and available or, or go into a chat room and say, hey, I'm online for the next three hours and offer two hours midday, that kind of thing. And just really have people be open and honest about when they're actually able to work. It is good to have either one-on-one -on -one conversations or schedule a meeting with the team to find out when are those overlaps in a day when everyone can be available and maybe schedule your stand up or a daily meeting during that time um you know it should be results driven not about uh the old the old button seat model kind of has to go away a bit now it's focused on how much work do we want to get done and, and and really drive toward accomplishing those goals in in unconventional ways and also a good practice is for folks to ensure accountability be happy we'll send an end of day update right i mean if, if you don't have a test tool that closely can give you an idea how much work was accomplished or if you're don't have enough of a, of a velocity kind of uh, model in place yet you really can tell based off of kind of project status items you know an end-of-day update with people detailing what they got done every day or what they're still working out what their blockers are and these are all fair things to ask of your, of your team right now um, and how you're gonna how, how you can be flexible but also ensure some accountability yeah, just to kind of um, reiterate some of what Josh said, flexibility is absolutely key. Um, it, probably no longer are your employees able to sit for eight straight hours at their desk and be able to get the work done in, in a 
you know, from eight to four or whatever your core hours might be. So you have to be super flexible. They may have work for a couple hours, have to take a couple hour break to go be a school teacher and then come back and go to work. So you're now your new hours of the day. Unfortunately, I saw that one question during the chat in the beginning about how do you keep the day from expanding? Unfortunately, in the new normal, you probably can't. It's probably going to go till 10 o'clock at night. There's a lot of parents who um, with their little children and school children, you know, until they go to bed at eight o'clock at night and then they're going to get back on and they're going to finish their day's work by like, you know, 10 o'clock that night. Um, I see people doing that quite a bit. Um, so you're also going to have to find potentially some new tools to kind of um, fill in the gaps of some of the work that you used to do while you were in person. So for example, you don't have a whiteboard anymore in a room with a bunch of people around that you can write stuff on, um, brainstorm on. So you need, you're going to need to find some new tools and we'll get more into that I think in a later question, but you're going to have to, you're going to have to look for potentially new tools to fill those gaps. Um, you may need to um, change some of your processes that you have currently today. So an example I can think of is if you're using Agile for delivery and you have an all day planning meeting with a big team, you may have to modify that team, that meeting structure to go maybe only a half a day because some of your employees are not going to be able to sit for the full day again because of the flexibility that they're going to need with their other activities, their children and stuff that they're going to be doing. So you may have to, um, you know, one team um, that I know of, they shrunk the team of attendees for the planning meeting. So they got it down to just a few and then they put it out to the rest of the greater team and the greater team then filled in their comments. You know, they participated when they could, but when they had to jump off, they jumped off. They would get a recap from the meeting and then fill in with notes later, that kind of thing. So you might have to look at changing and modifying some of your processes that you currently have. Um, just to get the most out of them. You um, still, it's very important still to understand what the meeting cadence is gonna be, um, that everybody knows when they are, regardless of what kind of a delivery model you're using. And then again, set the expectation for attendance, which might be different in the new normal than it was before. Um, you're gonna rely, I would say, on chatter a lot more. So some sort of a chat tool where people can have real-time chat conversations. Um, and then again, I would say, you know, what, what Josh was um, talking about is having a quick checkpoint on some uh, quick checkpoint calls when there's especially critical handoffs between teams or team members um, that require, you know, um, that require like maybe a more detailed conversation to sort of pick up the phone and, and you know, have a conference call uh, with some of those critical handoffs, make sure everything is in order, everything's been done. Um, people assume a lot of things, so it's better to have that conversation and make sure that people aren't making assumptions. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me, Kirk. We've had to change some of our communication norms um, in this new normal. And so typically, if we've had maybe a weather day where everybody has worked from home, we do our stand-ups via Slack. And everybody's just put their update in there. Or if somebody works from home, maybe they have a sick kid and they're working from home that day. They've just put their update in Slack. Well, now to increase our communication, we have wanted to make sure that everyone, we've set up the WebEx for Slack and that everybody's calling in. We're trying to get out of that, putting our update in Slack for our team standups. When this is over, we might shift back, but we've had to communicate some changes. So I think that we've got to be flexible what worked before might not be working now, but we might not have to stick with that as we go forward. And I think that's really cool that some of the things that we've adapted to now, not just in our work lives, but I think in our lives in general, these are things that you know, we're, we're realizing, hey, this, this is actually gonna work moving forward too. So I think some of the best practices that come out of the new normal and things that maybe we haven't done in the past are going to carry on and be best practices for when we go back to the quote unquote traditional model. So that's, that's a really good point, Chris. Well, I think as we talked about technology and tools and how um, that's really, how many of the tools are really gonna help the new way of doing things, I wanted to spend just a few minutes with each of you on what are your favorite tools and techniques for a remote testing environment, both traditionally and of course, what we've maybe adapted to over the last few weeks. 
So Kim, uh, you know, thoughts on that? Oh man, video conference tools. Um, they're worth their weight in gold as far as I, my experience have been, and um, you know, led lots of IT teams, but I'm also now as a business owner, it's, you know, it's HR, it's finance, it's all kinds of different teams and stuff, but video conferencing is great. It just kind of, again, going back to my original comment about video conference tools, it keeps people engaged. You can see people, it makes them accountable. They're not multitasking on six other things. Um, I don't know if you've been on conference calls where you then you ask a question to somebody and they go, um, what, sorry, I didn't hear you. You know, I, you get that a lot on, on just regular conference calls. So with the video though, they're a lot more engaged. You could, um, I would also, you know, just suggest using names when you're um, on a video conference call or any kind of a conference call. It just uh, keeps people just a lot more engaged, which is great for getting your meetings done on time, right? Um, Real-time chat platform of any kind. We use Slack at TapQA, um, but I've used lots of different tools at lots of different clients. They all seem to do a good job. Um, some also have desk share, you know, uh, desktop sharing in them. So it that makes it nice when you're working with a coworker one-on-one -on -one and you can share your desktop so they can see what you're seeing. Sometimes you need to see to analyze and figure out what the problems are. So that's always good. Um, so any kind of a chat tool with screen share is great. You know, desktop share is a good, is, is really good for remote working. And then just um, a good task tracking tool. There's lots of them out there. I know somebody earlier mentioned Trello, maybe that was you, Rick, but there's yeah. a lot of great tools out there. Um, and then, but the biggest thing I can say is try to standardize. If you haven't standardized on your tools, you're going to probably need to if you're going to work with remote teams. So you want everybody kind of using the same tool so that you can keep the communication constant and consistent with each other and you're not switching and downloading a bunch of tools. There's um, some of the clients that I've worked at where you're not allowed to download anything to your laptop. So you want to standardize on those tools and make sure everybody can communicate with each other the best way. Yeah, Kim mentioned Trello, and Trello is an amazing free tool right now. Um, we use it for tracking a lot of tasks. We use it for our kudos. So when we do our sprint retros, we'll go into there and add kudos for somebody who's done a great job over the, over the course of the sprint or over the course of the PI that we're working on. Um, I'm in a pretty mature model for working from home, so we use a lot of Teams, uh, Microsoft Teams, and uh, Skype. Um, Microsoft Teams seems to be pretty robust. It has file sharing tools. You can share your screen with each other. You can send data to each other. So we've been utilizing that a lot. Um, so it's just finding the tool that fits for you and seeing, you know, I know a lot of places aren't gonna wanna spend budgets on, on buying new tools. So take a look for the free things. And what we usually do is we vet it out for a week or so. And if it doesn't work, we get rid of it and find something else. Now is the time when you need to be flexible and creative and it also can serve as a little bit of a distraction for you too while you're while you're going through this it can help build a little team camaraderie because you're you're all looking for that thing that's going to help you achieve your goals i think also as we are in this new normal just keeping that personal connection. We're gonna talk about culture in a little bit, but I saw somebody's question about that social interaction too. We use Slack or something equivalent. You guys are used to instant chat, but pick up the phone, especially right now. Um, I'm used to having people stop by my office and that's the best part of my day when people just come in to chat. And we don't have that right now. So call somebody, hear their voice, don't rely just on that electronic communication. Um, use video chat for conferences. But also when I have status with my team, sometimes we do it on FaceTime and we have to get over that. Is there a mess behind us? Did I wash my hair today? Did I not? I don't know. Um, but it's okay because it's good to see these people that we're used to seeing on a daily basis, especially if this happened for your team rather abruptly. Um, you know, one day we were in the office and the next day we weren't. And so we miss people. So use the phone, use FaceTime, keep those interactions. Uh, you feel better when you hear somebody's voice from your team or see their face. To affect techniques a little bit, um, and there's a lot of tools that, that could do this, but I, I found that when I'm going into a remote meeting and I have a lot of information that I need to share, um, visuals are really helpful. So 
one thing I've been doing lately is creating mind maps as a way to, to bring in something to display on the screen in a meeting to give, uh, give a lot of information. There it is. So here's one that I did very recently. And as you can see, there's a lot of information on here. And I was, go I was laying, um, laying out a lot of core information about a new, a new client and the new project that we're taking on to the team that will be starting there before they started. Right, so it's just a good way to give everyone a lay of the land, the expectations, the way they do things, the way their environments are managed and how it's promoted, how we do status reports. And so um, mind maps can be used for very creative, very um, you know, collaborative sessions and get, and, and get, there's a lot of workshops you can do on, on effective mind mapping. So that's all really cool. And I, I encourage you guys to do that kind of thing. But this is just a way that I organize some thought. And it, it worked well for that too. I think this was a good way to go into a meeting with some, a good way to show what I'm talking about. And afterwards I could send this to people. Uh, it, it, it was also a good way of kind of recapping the meeting with notes. It killed towards the one stone, which I always like to do. So I would say this is a, a good way to, to do some of these meetings online. I use draw.io, which is just a browser based free, it's like a, 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 a free Visio. Um, but there's also tools like FreeMind and, and others that you can, you can use PowerPoint to, to, to lay out your thoughts um, in the mind map fashion. Uh, everyone, I have a, a couple of questions from the attendees that I just wanted to uh, share, one of which from June. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of tools out there, um, you know, a lot of video tools, a lot of collaboration tools. Certainly people still rely on email. What maybe is the best way to standardize a tool or a method for an entire team? So you have some people that are comfortable with one thing, some people are comfortable with another. Do you have a, a, a best practice so that, uh, you know, as a manager and as a leader, we aren't inundated by different methods from different teams or different individuals? Is it about, is this question more about your own team or is it more about across like an organization where different teams are picking different tools? If it's across the bigger teams of the organization, then the leadership team has to make some decisions and, and probably say, here's the tool that we're going to use. And if individuals between, you know, a coworker, you pop offline and use another tool, Tool well, but if you're going to be using it within the organization, that needs to come from the leadership team. If it's within, if you're talking about your own team, um, I can tell you that at TechQA, we use Slack. Wasn't my favorite tool because I wasn't used to it. And people don't like what they're not used to. They like more what they're used to. I like Slack now because I've been using it a lot. No, you know, so I admit that. But I got outvoted is what we did at, at TechQA. I just I got outvoted. It's like everybody else wanted Slack. So I'm like, all right, I got outvoted. So we're going to use Slack. So, you know, it can be a vote, you know, what are the most people using? Is it something that the company, um, it's a, is it a company tool that the company already has access to? Um, so, um, you know, I think you have to, you have to look at, you know, that first, does the company already have a standardized tool that they want you to use? Um, because maybe they're paying for it. Um, and then does it suffice with like all the pieces that you need it to do? Like if you need to be able to do screen sharing, then you want to pick a chat tool or something that you can screen share with or make sure you have another tool like uh, WebEx or something that you can share desktops and stuff. So it's kind of like make a list of like what your criteria is um, to be successful and what kinds of capability do you need for your team every, every week? Um, so that they can be efficient and effective and then figure out which tools kind of match that um, come down to an option. Yeah, I think that the other thing that I've done is, is start up a focus group. I kind of show two different tools and really get feedback from a, a, a small group who represents the, the company, different kinds of users of the tools and maybe put it to vote for them or figure out which way they're leaning towards. And that's also a good thing to to communicate back to once you do roll out the tool, we settled on this. Part of the justification is we show it to the focus group and they all wanted this one. Just as a good way to get additional buy-in. And and things that are easy to collaborate with and have multi multi um, updates going on at the same time. You know, there's 
I'm like everybody else. I, I have my favorite tools. Um, Josh will tell you that I was not a huge fan of Google Docs, um, but you can collaborate really easy. Multiple people can use it and stuff. So again, I get, I get outvoted a lot, but you know, I got outvoted again. So we're still, you know, using um, some shared tools that allow for multiple updates from multiple different people, even simultaneously and can track, so. And if I can add to that, I think that once tools are chosen as an, at an organizational level, on your team levels, especially as a leader, encourage practicing using those tools. We have WebEx, it's what we use at the NAIC. And honestly, we didn't use it that often, at least on my team prior to this, because for the most part, we were all in the office together every day and we didn't need to do that. And so we kind of knew that this was coming. We weren't sure when, but we started practicing. Can we set up a WebEx? Can we you know, share our screen? Do we know how to do those things? Things that we think that we know how to do, but that might feel uncomfortable in the moment when you're put on the spot in a meeting. Um, Josh has offered this mind map example. I think collaboration, we use the whiteboard a ton, and I think collaboration is going to be a big deal soon as this extends. We need to have that capability. And so find a tool if you can just find something for your team and then make sure everybody knows you're practicing. To, you know, maybe it works for that meeting. Rick mentioned that earlier. If it doesn't work, try something else the next time, but let people learn to use the technology and, you know, al allow some patience while we're learning to do that and choosing these tools because we're not gonna all be experts right away. And a question that um, Nick had put into the question and answer session that. is um, uh, fi finding the lag with some of these tools is causing a lot of unintended talking over one another. Um, any ways of working around this issue? Um, you know, I, I, I'll throw in an answer here. I mean, I, I use Zoom a lot. I think it's just really kind of, uh, getting used to it more than anything else. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of people are going to have different connection speeds and everything. So, I, you know, maybe one best practice is kind of wait an extra second before you are going to give a reply to your answer. I mean, unfortunately, a perfect real-time conversation, like you're literally sitting in the same room with one another, it's a little tougher to, to emulate that in Zoom. Uh, so maybe kind of the one second rule of uh, responding back. Um, you know, the, the talking over one another, I mean, even in live and in person that happens uh, when you're in a room with, with one another. Um, so I don't know, just the, kind of that one second pause is what I've typically done. I don't know if the, the four of you have uh, experienced similar things or maybe uh, have another thought on that. Yeah, I would just say uh, managing, oh, there we go. We're talking over each other. I, I would just say that managing Looks like Rick might have uh, a, a It helps the order move along and it helps people uh, participate a little better. Uh oh, did anyone hear any of that or? Um, it, we lost you for a second, which uh, again, you know, a real time example of how sometimes these tools aren't perfect. <laughs> exactly. I always work as planned, yes. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I was just saying that, that we had, I was managing yeah. test teams from India and we were running into some issues like that. So we instituted a little bit of a pause in there to catch up so that we weren't talking over each other. As a, uh, if you're leading the meeting, you can also, like, it, like we're doing for this um, presentation, you can use the hand raise thing and the leader can call on people as well. No, all great points. Um, no, and thanks for the questions. We appreciate it. Wanted to move along since we have, um, we wanted to leave plenty of time uh, at the end for a question and answer session. Uh, but one of the biggest uh, things to help us all will be to promote that culture that allows remote testing to thrive. So the culture of, uh, you know, trust, accountability, things like that. Uh, Rick, I'd like to start with you here. Uh, a client that we work with at TAP QA is Red Wing Shoes. And Red Wing uh, in some cases out of necessity, but in a lot of cases just uh, because they, they have a great culture and a great work culture to begin with, uh, they've really thrived in this remote testing culture. And I wanted uh, to see if we could pick your brain a little and, and share some uh, best practices or just some, some ways that Red Wing has really built that culture. Sure. I am working at Red Wing Shoes, as, as uh, Kirk was saying. And it's a pretty mature model in terms of uh, working from home. One of the things that they've done is they built a lot of trust into self-management. So 
the manager, the managers or the leads or whatever, we will make sure that we're talking to people in the one-on-ones. We'll make sure that we over-communicate. We're making sure that um, if you're going to be offline for any amount of time, you're setting your statuses as offline. We send out emails from time to time to say, hey, I've got a dentist appointment at 10 o'clock, so I'll be out from you know 10 until 11 and back online for the rest of the afternoon. And by doing those sorts of things, knowing where people are, being able to get in touch with folks, those are the things that build trust as you go along. Also, they've shifted over to a, a managed by results sort of situation. So it's more or less, hey, are you getting things done? If there are people that, I know there was a question earlier about, um, you know, what if somebody needs a little more management or a little more uh, direction? Um, that's where one-on-ones on, one on come in. You can do those checkpoints during the day with that person, or you set up a schedule with that person that, that hey, we need you to take care of these things during the day and we'll check in at the end of the day. Um, part of the self-management also goes into uh, the tasks that are at hand. When we have user stories that we get created for uh, during our sprint, we're, we're using an agile situation down there. So when we have user stories, people are picking the user stories they wanna do. Everybody kind of picks, you know, sometimes somebody will take uh, a larger user story, sometimes somebody will take a smaller one, but we're using that collaboration and that communication with each other to figure out, okay, if you know Josh were to take a bigger user story, then I'm gonna take a smaller one and then I'm gonna move over and help Josh with that. Um, also being able to manage up as well as down. So being a lead or being the manager in a situation where you have working from home going on, you have a lot of the C-level leadership or directors or VPs that want to know that people are getting the work done. So that takes a little bit of finesse in that. So when you get to the point where you're working from home, whereas in, in the current norm, I'm sure there's some worry, are people doing the work? And being able to show that, yes, they are getting that done by showing the results or by managing or inviting them into your standups, things like that, so they understand or explaining all of the components of working from home, it'll help to build that trust all around. So I know for some of you, you're gonna be building this from the ground up. So there's, there's gonna be points where you stumble and fall. Um, I know that all of us, you can get information from Kirk to get a hold of us and we'd be able to share you know, more stories. I'm kind of going a little fast because I know we're kind of running out of time. So I wanted to get some of the most succinct things. There's gotta be trust, over communication. And if you have someone like, you know, that might need a little more direction, you may have to talk with them a little bit more until they get used to working in this model and until you get to a point where you've, you're used to how they're working in this model. Those are all really great points, Rick. Um, couldn't have said it better. Um, a couple of things that just come to mind um, that, we, that we haven't, you know, maybe brought up quite yet is to make sure you're still rewarding performance and acknowledging good work. You know, thank you goes a long way, um, especially today. Um, people need to feel, still feel good about what they're doing. And since, you know, so make sure you're, you're giving those accolades out um, pretty regularly um, to pull the team together and they know that they're doing a good job. And then they'll, cause everybody wants to perform well. So, make sure that they understand that you know they're doing a good job, um, especially when you're being flexible because this flexible, you know, these flexible hours are making people nervous, right? It's like, wow, you know, what if they don't think I'm online enough or whatever, you know, they don't know what other people are thinking. So to just make sure you're, you're acknowledging good work and um, good performance. And the other thing I would say is, you know, because people are anxious, depression's running high, um, parents are stressed because they're trying to wear multiple hats. So try to find some fun and humor um, during the day with your team. It makes them feel more connected. And, you know, if they're smiling, then they're not anxious or depressed, right? You know, so it, anything that helps them be in a good mood is going to help their, um, their performance. I agree with everything that Rick and Kim said, you know, communication, trust, all of those things. And especially right now, this is such a different situation. Check in with your team. If you're a leader, you know, post in Slack, how's everybody doing today? Check in with people individually um, and make sure everybody's okay. I have shared with my team that some days are better than others. So be real with them as well. Um, and just make sure that right now, everybody, you know, we're getting our needs met 
and that, that we feel good and the work, the work will come. Um, but check in with people as, as people as well. Yeah, there is that ultimate feeling like I need to be right in front of the laptop or the computer all day long. And what I've been telling people is to make sure they get up and stretch. If they have a moment that they need, just ping somebody, you know, and we, uh, we practiced something last week where we're supposed to reach out to three different people on three different teams and just check on people, say hello, say something we like about what they did. You know, all these sorts of things will bring people closer together and this time we're supposed to stay apart. And that for someone like me is a little bit difficult sometimes where it's, it's, I love working that office atmosphere and talking to people all day long and helping and, and being around. Whereas now I'm like, I'm a little, you know, I'm in my own box right now. And so I reach out during the day and I'll send a comment to somebody or, or, you know, just whatever I need to do. We can't hear you, Josh. Josh, you're on mute. There you go. <laughs> cool. I guess I'm back. So what I was going to say was think about anything, anything that you can bring, uh, any continuity you can bring into the new world, right? So the example I thought of was that back in the, back in the old world at TAPQA, when we had a, a strong office uh, environment, our office administrator, Jackie, would write a question of the day on a big whiteboard in the break room. So a high traffic area, big question of the day, like what's the best burger joint in town, right? And there's, and people are encouraged to kind of add to the board. And so people have names, then people, you know, do funny responses, and then a lot of plays on words. And it became kind of a, a cool culture thing that we just kind of got used to. And every day you read the boards, like, oh, that's, that's really funny. And so that essentially was lost, right, for a very short while, not even probably a, a, maybe a day or two, before we just brought that same concept to a general Slack channel post. So every morning, Jack, you can still go on there and post a question of the day. And it still prompts a lot of great threads and gifts and responses like the first day i think was hey who is your new co-workers and so we saw a ton of people's pets right and plants and kids and it was a it was a really cool kind of a continuity kind of thing to to bring into the new world here and i really liked that um the other thought i had was something that would not have interested me in the least back you know a couple of weeks ago which is the idea of a virtual happy hour right i could not have imagined that I'd, I'd get online with work people over uh, over Zoom and, and just chat. But, you know, turns out it there, there are some, some positive impacts and you do feel a connection um, in that human kind of connection way that you don't typically get on work calls. So I'd encourage you to, to, to think about how you can do some of those things on Friday afternoons or, or whenever or mm -hmm. eat virtual lunches together. And I've noticed even a couple of folks in the chat room have talked about the virtual happy hours and how they are doing it with their companies as well, uh, which is great and, and totally agree. It's just, you know, the more face-to-face -face interaction we can have with our team members and our employees is, is great. Uh, one thing we did last week at Tap QA on Friday afternoon is we had an online trivia contest where uh, we gave a prize to the person who had the most points. And, and that went over really, really well. And you could just see... Uh, you know, people were really thankful, I think, to have that. And people were really uh, engaged. And it's just like, oh, I haven't seen Matt in, you know, weeks, if not months, or I haven't seen, you know, so-and-so. And it was just, you know, again, being a consulting company too, we have a lot of folks that are, you know, kind of all over the place. So to have a, uh, you know, kind of a centralized event like that was really fun. Um, I've also <clears throat> heard from others that, you know, kind of emulating the, um, you know, kind of any kind of collaborative game that you have in your office. I know Chris, having been to your office, you guys are awesome with the giant puzzle that you mm -hmm. have on the, um, on the file cabinet in your office. And I'm amazed at like how quickly your team gets through that puzzle. I mean, I think I, I've been there like five days and I think I've seen seven different puzzles or something like that. <laughs> uh, it's awesome. Well, having like some sort of an online collaborative puzzle or just some sort of a game or some kind of a mission just to say, hey, when you get a chance, chime in, you know, join in on the fun. Um, you know, the question of the day is a great thing, but just anything that is going to just give people that escape for a very brief period of time is, is great. Just something to break up the monotony of just doing this work from home every day. Um, you know, all of that I think is gonna help create a great culture. I think everybody's getting a lot more creative. So it's great to share ideas um, across 
teams and companies about some of the ideas you've come up with. You know, one of the things uh, that I have set up for um, my HR team is to we're going to go out and just do that 15 minute walk outside when it's nice and FaceTime each other in a group so that we're talking to each other while we're walking um, to kind of, you know, kill a couple birds with one stone, so to speak. You know, so I think people are getting really super creative um, to, to kind of connect. And it's, it, I think it would be fun to like actually have a place where we could share ideas, Kirk. Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, in fact, I, uh, I did type that question into the chat room. If any of you have a creative team activity you've implemented in the past month, it'd be great to hear from you. Um, you know, feel free to enter that in chat. Um, so we have a few minutes and certainly we can uh, carry over uh, you know, beyond, um, beyond our, our hour here. But I wanted to close maybe with just one uh, you know, kind of final thought and maybe you know, for each of you, what's the best lesson that you've learned here over the past few weeks in our new normal? And we'll start with you, Chris, because uh, Chris, you know, knowing that NAIC has had some experience with remote work, but this is definitely the first time you've had your entire team out for, uh, you know, an extended period of time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the biggest thing for me right now, what I keep telling my team, what I keep telling myself is to have grace with each other, with ourselves. There are days that are going to be good. There are days that are going to be bad. Um, I think Kim touched on it earlier about, you know, feeling like you need to be logged on all the time. And I feel that way. Am I spending enough time doing school with my daughter? Am I spending enough time doing work? We all need to give ourselves some grace and breathe right now because we're going to get through this and, and we're going to, it's going to be okay. Yeah, Chris is, is absolutely right about, about that. I, I don't, one thing that's changed in, in my approach is I tend to be a, a managed by walking around type of person. I, I don't always, haven't always had to plan out every conversation and just kind of go and find the person or keep an eye out for them or pick up the phone if I know they should be working at that time of day and not in a meeting, if I know their schedule, not in a meeting. Those, those, those sporadic things don't work quite as well as they used to right now. So I ping someone I am and don't hear back for a while and, you know, um, call and goes to voicemail. So I still want to have those calls and, and, and do individual check-ins and touch points, but just having a little bit more patience with, you know, understanding and maybe a bit of a pause before they actually happen or doing a bit better job of scheduling things in so it doesn't interrupt someone's lesson with their, with their kid um, is just one way that I'm kind of adapting to the, the, the new normal. And Rick, I don't know if you were going to jump in there um, next or not, but I mean, the biggest thing I've learned is just to call instead of email or text when you can. It, it does extend your workday a little bit longer because now instead of something taking like two or three minutes, it's probably going to take you 15 to have the conversation. But people need that connection and need to talk to a real human sometimes instead of electronically. And then, you know, I couldn't say it any better than what Chris said it has said, you know, and just kind of have some a good understanding that your new normal does not look like your teammates new normal so i don't have little kids at home so my new normal is uh, completely different than chris's um, so you have to be super understanding that not everybody's new normal is the same either yeah i guess I, i've got just a couple of things that that have been really good one of them is a contact buddy list we all picked buddies on our list and we exchanged i don't know if everybody can do this but we exchanged telephone numbers and email addresses so that if we can't get a hold of somebody there's we start the tree and just start calling a few different different people to see if they've heard from somebody we had a situation about a week and a half ago where we knew somebody was sick the night before and then they didn't show up online until almost midday the next day because they, they just slept all the way through because they were so sick. They didn't have the coronavirus, but they were sick. So during one of a couple of our meetings, there were people, you know, pinging each other. Have you heard from so-and-so? Have you heard from so-and-so? So within a couple of hours, we'd set up the contact buddy list. And then that person actually did show up and they were fine and, and everything was good. But it was just, it caused a lot of stress at first. And so we've done that. Um, the daily distractions, I know we're only supposed to pick one, but daily distractions are awesome. Got a recipe for a macaroni and cheese hamburger where they made the, the <laughs> bun out of macaroni and cheese. Oh. And uh, setting the away notifications, just making sure that 
you're staying in constant, as much contact as possible. So like I said, if you're going to be away for a while, you just say that you're going to be away for a while and then nobody frets about it because they know the work is going to get done. You have to have that trust that they're going to keep their velocity and their capacity up. You know, all of these things are going to work, excuse me, <clears throat> work together to, you know, make you successful and give you that feeling of, yes, we're still working and we're all together. Well, Rick, I will speak for every one of the attendees where I, I think we need to have that macaroni and cheese bun recipe. Oh, I know. Yes. <laughs> you uh, send that to me. I'll be happy to send that out to everybody. Okay. Um, no, this is great and, and really appreciate all of your time. I think this is a great opportunity for us to open it up for uh, a Q&A session. Um, if you have questions, uh, any of the folks that are attending, feel free to enter those into the chat room or uh, the Q&A box. Uh, I'm going to share just some of the uh, some of the things that we've seen in the chat room as far as kind of the fun ideas and and um, you know best practices. We talked about virtual happy hours. Um, Nick had said they play you don't know Jack, which is a um, a, a trivia contest via Zoom, uh, and also trivia and rap battles. I I, I can't imagine a, a QA rap battle being you know not the awesomest thing on earth. I, I would love to see that. Uh, I, I think that, you know, Nick, I'm going to have to reach out to you in, in private and get some videos of those rap battles. Sounds fun. Uh, though. I think they sound amazing. Yeah, that, that sounds fantastic. Um, <laughs> Stacy had mentioned just, you know, sharing in, in Teams or in Slack or whatever communication channel that you use, just some of the humorous work from home outcomes that you have. Uh, crazy kid antics, furry coworkers. Uh, those kind of go along with some of the questions of the day that we had that were great. Um, we, uh, we also had, uh, you know, delivering things in costume. Uh, oop, sorry about that. Um, I got to get my chat box here. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> so have check-in meetings with themes. So have a themed check-in check meeting where you have costumes, uh, something you've worked on, uh, your favorite meal recipe like we talked about with Rick. Um, I mean, those are all great ideas. So uh, thanks for sharing. Um, Opening it up to additional questions, uh, anyone have any more questions for our panel? While we do that, I'll, I'll put this slide up here just a little bit more on tap QA. Because that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> No, it's, I think, you know, something we, we touched on just a little bit. Uh, do you see things that we are learning today or learning over the last month that something that we've never done before, but you, you see carrying on? I think, you know, one, one thing I continue to hear is um, for those organizations that were reluctant to move to more of a remote testing model, this is kind of our dry run to be able to do it. Now, of course, we've been forced into this dry run, which, is, which makes it a little weird. But a lot of organizations now have a comfort level that, hey, we can have folks that are, you know, not even maybe in the same city that we're in, uh, you know, doing our work and, and, you know, working on our teams and things like that. Do you agree with that? Do you think that this is, uh, you know, really, you know, helping all of us uh, or helping our organizations really get that comfort level with remote testing? Uh, any, uh, I'll, that was addressed to the whole, uh, is anyone, <laughs> would anyone be interested in weighing in on that? You mean any, the panelists or the, yes. uh, the participants? Yeah, sorry about that. Yes, what? <laughs> I still don't know. Yes, the panelists, sorry. <laughs> it's about communication, <laughs> being clear, <laughs> this is how it goes. <laughs> right. Now I forgot your question, sorry. Oh, sorry. So, um, you know, one thing, and, and this is, we've, we've heard this a little bit, even in talking with customers at TapQA, that this is really just kind of setting the stage for companies to, to embrace and feel much more comfortable with a remote testing environment or, remote, you know, work from home teams. Uh, do, you, do you agree with that? Or do you think that once we get over the hump here with everything that we're going through right now, that companies are going to say, hey, we, we tried that. It didn't necessarily work for us. I hope people are more, uh, companies are more flexible because it um, certainly opens up opportunities, I think, that you wouldn't normally have if you're restricted to a geographic area. Um, from a talent pool perspective, for sure. Um, I think it's also a preferred, some of the new things that we're doing right now, I think is preferred by 
different age groups um, to engage maybe more of the techie, you know, the people that are more tied to their technology, um, those age groups and stuff. So I hope it, it changes some, but I also think that we're naturally creatures of habit. And so when we're going to be so excited to get back into the office and see everybody when we finally can, um, that I think, um, people are going to say, yeah, it worked, but I like this better, um, perhaps on some things. So I don't know. Well, I guess we'll find out. I think that this could actually be a good model for starting a work from home program. Um, maybe one or two days a week for most places you can start start with something like this, maybe a full fledged working from home is not going to work for you, but offering it as a, a balance to the, the in the office work day every day um, would be something that would be attractive to a lot of a lot of candidates nowadays. Um, the current situation that I'm in, the client is an hour and a half hour and change away from the major city. And so in order to attract talent to drive down there every day, or at least, you know, a few times a week, they offer work from home so that it attracts different talent from different areas. Now, I think, Kirk, we've, we've had, um, we've had clients here at TAPQA that have, have really had to scale, right, due to a, a huge launch, brand new platform, um, you know, they scale up, you know, running nine or 12 agile teams to support a project. And we've, we've been able to, to find, um, I know it's not working from home, but it's a remote uh, from the client type situation by, by doing some things really well and, and, and gearing the team to succeed, like creating a really solid onboarding plan, right? I mean, that's really important for being able to quickly spin up someone into a new environment and make um, and show value right away. I think some of those processes like solid onboarding plans, clear, um, standards, uh, uh, deciding which tools company-wide you should adopt and, and standardize on are all really good and helpful things that'll um, aid in kind of more remote, remote work even when you don't have to be at home anymore. I saw a question out here, unless somebody else is gonna join in and tag on to, uh, mm -hmm. tag on to what Josh was saying, but there's a question out here. Should you start measuring productivity and how would you do this without being too obvious? And I think you have to look at this in, in the new norm and with the traditional way. The traditional way would be just, you know, your, your, your regular check-ins, you're, you're doing this today, this is what I expect done by the end of day. Your new norm, you might have to extend your period of when you're allowing something to be complete. If you're doing agile, you can always look at your capacity and your velocity and see what's going on there. If you're doing the waterfall method, then, you know, since if we're talking strictly test information, then you're looking at your test cases past, completed, failed, your runs, that sort of thing. Um, I, would, I would hesitate to be really harsh about that right now, especially with all the, the anxiety that's out there, a lot of the stresses that are going on, because you don't want to add that one more thing to the list, but yet you still want to get the work done and you still want the work to be completed. So I think we all need to be a little a little more flexible in that range, but not so much so that nothing's getting done. I hope that kind of helps. I think some of that too, for those of us who are in an agile situation, we can count, hopefully can count on the teams, right? To be able to hold each other accountable, whether that work is happening from nine to five, like maybe it had been previously, but if your work is done in the sprint, if you're accountable to your teammates, and hopefully if not, people are speaking up as part of that self-managed team. So hopefully we can rely on each other too. Um, hey, do you have this done? And it doesn't just have to be something that as leaders, we are managing that productivity. Our team should still be seeing um, that, that same work. It might just be, it might look a little different right now when it's getting done. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Kirk, you I'm muted. Uh, again, tools only work as well as the person using them, right? Hey, uh, good tip, though, on big groups is have everybody be on mute. <laughs> if that one didn't come up earlier, it's like everyone should be on one of the meeting roles. Be on mm -hmm. mute and then unmute yourself when you're talking. And I, I, 
I have a story to share about this. So my, my son has done some uh, online basketball training and this organization here in Minneapolis who's awesome. Uh, they used Zoom for the very first time this weekend. And um, for those of you that are familiar with Zoom, anytime you have a meeting and someone <clears throat> makes a noise, it will default to their camera. Well, imagine over 500 kids with a basketball, dribbling a basketball uh, while a teacher's trying to do instructions. And every time, you know, this camera would hear a noise, it would kind of default. So literally the camera is bouncing around to probably over a hundred different kids. So you'll have, you know, the instructor on screen for just a matter of seconds. And then you'll have some other, you know, other boy dribbling a basketball. Then it's another boy, then it's another girl. Then it's, I mean, it was just like chaos. So <laughs> a really good point when you do these large group meetings, um, you know, to, even if you're leading these meetings to <clears throat> do the mute everybody uh, feature or to look at doing like a webinar sort of thing like we're doing where, um, you know, the only time you can speak is if a host or a panelist actually allows you to do that. So um, yeah, it's a great tip. <clears throat> so with that, any last thoughts, Rick, Chris, Josh, Kim? I, it's a challenging situation. Uh, everybody will, I think we're all going to learn a lot about ourselves, about how we like to work, about what works best for us. I think a lot of us are going to be very happy to see our teammates when all of this is over, but we might have some changes in how we're working in the long term. So um, if you're struggling, it's okay. I am too. We'll make it through. <laughs> Everybody's learning fast, I think. So just try things, try different things. Not everything's going to work. Um, and that's okay. Just let it go. Try something different. It's the whole, you know, whole agile fail fast thing. You know, if it doesn't work, move on to something else. Don't, don't worry about it. Yeah, same here. Now just offer up if anyone wants to get more, you know, one-on-one -on -one or have a Zoom about anything that we talked about or an idea you have, you want to float by um, someone, just, you know, say, we'll make it happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd love to hear new ideas from people that are out there. Um, um, like I've been telling everybody, you know, it's, it's one of those times where, where things are kind of volatile. Um, check in with your friends, check in with your loved ones, check in with your coworkers. Stand up, stretch every once in a while. Like when, as soon as we're done here, I'm going to go stretch my legs because it's beautiful outside. But <laughs> those are the things that are on my mind constantly. We, you think about your family, you think about your friends and everybody and your coworkers and keep that in mind. And then try and stay as focused as you can, but give yourself those breaks and allow yourself like, like Chris was saying that, Hey, we're going to have days where we struggle, you know, so that's okay. Well, thanks again for uh, attending everybody. We really appreciate it. Uh, again, I have my email on uh, this slide here. So it's just kwalton at tapqa.com. I uh, would love to talk to you further about how we can help, whether it's, you know, what we actually do in the consulting world, or even just sharing some tips and best practices, uh, you know, as we hear from all of you and hear what you're doing, it really helps us as well uh, to kind of stay on top of trends and new ideas for us. I mean, we're always open to learning and, um, you know, it really, uh, it does, it helps us to be able to bring those best practices and, and ideas to our clients as well. So uh, with that, uh, I wanted to thank again, Chris Fisher, Rick Pope, Josh Brenneman and Kim Bunda for joining us today. And uh, again, please reach out to us if we can be of any help to you at all. Uh, this is a great session and uh, really hope uh, and wish you all the best here in our new normal. And uh, hopefully the last hour and change was, uh, was helpful for you. So again, thank you. And uh, we'll look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.